Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We have a special guest. Today's episode is called, hold on, let me get my spectacles on, how to set up your dog for success with vibrant health and longevity. And our amazing guest today is Dr. Judy Morgan, DVM, CVA, CVCP, CVFT. You'll have to tell us what those mean. Dr. Judy has over 37 years experience as an integrative veterinarian, acupuncturist, chiropractor, food therapist, author, and speaker. Her goal is to change the lives of pets by educating and empowering pet parents worldwide in the use of natural healing therapies and minimizing the use of chemicals, vaccination, and poor quality processed food. 2018 Woman of the Year in the Pet Industry. 2019 Pet Age Woman of Influence, 2019 IAOTP Veterinarian of the Year, 2019 Veterinary Hero Award nominee, and 2021 IAOTP Empowered Woman of the Year. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Morgan. Welcome. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Woohoo! Okay, so you have so much that you want to cover. I understand briefly, we're going to cover vaccines, food, drugs, and chemicals. So I'm going to let you unpack that however you like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this was introduced as a dog health and vitality for longevity. But what I'm going to talk about really has to do with any of our pets, whether they're dogs, cats, horses, uh, whatever it is that that you have as your furry companion, we need to start being a lot more mindful about what we are doing to our pets. So if we go back to, I started practice in the mid 1980s. If we go back to that time, back to the 70s and 80s, so you know we're, we're, we've gone quite a way since then, and we think that yeah. we have improved our veterinary medicine since then. And in a lot of ways we have, we have a lot of specialists, we have a lot of specialties, we have a lot of capabilities. Unfortunately, we've also gone backwards a, a lot of the time with what we're doing with our pets. If we look at a average size dog, so we'll say like mm -hmm. a 60 pound dog back mm -hmm. in the 1970s and 80s, the average lifespan was 17 years. Wow. Now the average lifespan is 10. No, we lost half of their lifespan yeah. in the last 50 years. And so by doing all these things that we think are improving their lives, we're actually cutting their lives short. And I'm not going to blame it all on my profession. I'm also going to blame it on our environment, which has become so toxic. Sure. Um, I'm going to blame it on the busyness of people and the changes in our lifestyles. So if we go back and look at, you know, the early 1900s, we, a lot of us had farms. We weren't as, you know, coalesced in cities. We weren't so busy and we were feeding ourselves natural diets that we grew when our soil still had minerals in it that, yes. that produce healthy food. So, so many things have changed. We now have factory farming, we have factory raised meat, we have processed right. food, we have convenience. Mm -hmm. And that convenience has cost our pets a lot. So we've also developed vaccinations. Vaccinations have saved a lot of lives. Sure. I went to veterinary school, it's from 1980 to 1984, so I'm dating myself. However, that was when the parvovirus first started really hitting our dogs and we were losing litters of puppies. Our veterinary clinic at the college was just loaded with puppies spewing bloody vomit, bloody diarrhea and dying. And those that lived were left with heart problems and just all kinds of long-term damage. Mm -hmm. So the parvovirus vaccine actually originated, they took a cat parvovirus and started using that to inject uh, dogs and then they developed the parvovirus vaccine. So was it a good vaccine? Was it a good development? Absolutely. Distemper vaccine, parvo vaccine, rabies vaccine, they save lives. The sure. problem, the problem was that when they came out, somebody arbitrarily said, 
we should vaccinate our pets every single year. And veterinarians had this great idea. Well, if we say they need a booster every, and nobody did the testing to find out how long it lasted. That was part of okay. the problem. Yeah. So it, it just became this, we'll send a reminder every year that your dog or cat is due for shots. Well, yeah. that gets you in the office because you're scared to death. Your dog might get parvovirus or distemper or your cat sure. might get distemper. So that gets you in the office. The mistake with the profession, from my opinion, <laughs> and with hindsight now, um, mm -hmm. is that what we should have been stressing was bring your pet in for an exam. Let's let a professional listen to their heart, palpate their abdomen, feel their joints, look in their eyes, look in their ears. That's what we should be. We should be look, looking at proactive medicine because now here we are decades later. And what we know yeah. is that those vaccines that are given as puppies and kittens may last a lifetime. Why? Yes. That was Why? my question. The immunity. <laughs> Why are we poking them every year? And so what we are seeing okay. is a lot more autoimmune disease, allergic disease, immune systems that don't know how to react. So you'd have your, your dog or cat who had puppy vaccines or kitten vaccines, which by the way, they should get a series of two, not four, five, six, or seven, which is what I keep seeing. It makes me crazy. What are the they, two? So, well, they need a series of two. And frankly, in my practice, I even split it up even more. Um, okay. So they would get a December vaccine. And really, ideally, you want to wait until they're 10 weeks old before you give them a vaccine, which is very okay. hard. Because if you're getting them from a shelter, if you're getting them from a breeder, they're going to start vaccinating at six weeks of age, which is right. so, so bad. And it, it actually decreases their ability to, um, to mount a good immune reaction to the vaccine. Interesting. If, okay. If we wait, we let the mother's immunity wear off. And we wait, we start them a little bit later we can give a lot fewer vaccines and actually get a stronger vaccine immunity. Okay. So uh, what I started doing in my practice is I would wait until the puppies and kittens were a little bit older. I would give them one distemper vaccine and one parvo vaccine. Okay. And then we would come back in about four weeks and do something called a titer, which is a blood test. And it tells you they've got immune protection or they don't. If they have immune protection, there's no need to give them another vaccine. If I love that. Have, yeah. So oh why gosh. would we stimulate the immune system again? And if they don't have protection, then you go, okay, well, we're going to give them a little booster. We're going to give the immune system a little poke to say, hey, you know, I need a little better, better response. Um, and then 99% of the time, then you're going to get a, a good titer out of them. Um, so yeah. the same with the rabies vaccine. So we have core vaccines and then we have lifestyle vaccines. But the core vaccines are really distemper, parvo, and rabies. And rabies is a problem because that's what we call zoonotic, which means we can get it if we get bitten by a rabid animal. Okay. So um, I understand why the government says that the animals have to be vaccinated every three years with rabies, but we do know that the huge majority of animals will hold a rabies vaccine titer for seven to eight years or more. So that, wow. yeah. So the three years again, it's kind of arbitrary. So the pet parent, has to do this research and then has to go to the veterinarian. Now, the, yes. the, the really sad thing is that the AVMA and AHA, which are it's the American Veterinary Medical Association, American Animal Hospital Association, on their websites, they have a statement that says dogs and cats should not be vaccinated more often than every three to five years for the core vaccines. Yet 60% of veterinarians still give them annually. Wow. So it is up to the pet parent, do your research, know what you're doing and be able to go in armed with information. <laughs> like you can even print the thing off the AVMA and say, hey, yeah, no. <laughs> um, right. But you, need, you need to be armed with that information and you need to be armed with, hey, I'd rather have a blood test. Now, sadly, somebody just texted me today. Her veterinarian wants $600 to run a rabies titer. Ooh. Kansas State University charges the veterinarian $47 to run a rabies tiger. So if you're being charged $600, go somewhere else because yeah. that's highway robbery. So th yeah. this is where my whole job in life now is educating pet parents so that you, you know what to ask for, you know what your animal needs, you know how to keep them 
healthier, not attack their immune mm -hmm. system. And you know how to have a conversation with your veterinarian and say, look, I, I, I know what this costs. Yes, I'm willing to pay for the office visit. I'm willing to pay for the blood draw and for you to ship the sample to them. That's not worth $550. <laughs> right. Agreed. Okay. That's so, amazing. So that's kind of the spiel on vaccines. And then you have to look at their lifestyle. You know, if you have uh, a dog that's a hunting dog out in the fields, that's a lot different than a, a little pocket pet who lives in a high rise in New York City. So you really <laughs> yeah. have to have, you have to educate yourself and, uh, you know, have that conversation. And my book from needles to natural has a, the longest chapter in that book is on vaccines where it talks about every single one of the vaccines that are available for our dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. whether they're recommended, how often they're recommended. So whether it's a core vaccine or a lifestyle vaccine. So it's really important that pet parents educate themselves and understand so that you can have that conversation. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. I'm so excited. And I'm wondering now, this is off topic, but why do we not do that for humans that with the titer tests? Anyway. We should. We, <laughs> know. We, well, you know, interestingly, as, as someone in the pet profession, Yes. Um, veterinary students are all required to get rabies vaccine. Now, when I was in veterinary school, they were doing an experimental rhesus monkey rabies vaccine. And so that's what all the students got. We, we were the experiment. Oh, um, okay. And I think we had to get a series of two, but like our technicians, they're required to be vaccinated to work in the field in a lot uh -huh. of states, not all states, but in a lot of states. Sure. And I did get bitten by a rabid cat probably 15 years after um, I had gotten my vaccines in veterinary Your school. Your monkey injection. Yes. My monkey injection. And so mm -hmm. when I went to the hospital, they did draw a titer to see whether I had protection. I still did, but it didn't get me out of getting the five vaccines that you have to get after being exposed. So <laughs> oh. even though I had a titer, I still had to get injected. <laughs> So it stunk. Um, but yeah, I mean, some titers are available and some are not. Like even for all okay. of the pet vaccines, there aren't titers available. And for uh -huh. a lot of them, you don't need them. Some of them we do know they are only a one year vaccine. Um, for instance, leptospirosis, which is a lifestyle vaccine for dogs. Uh, it only uh -huh. lasts a year. There's no sense doing a titer. So that's why you need to be educated so that you don't waste money on ones where it's not going to give you information and you spend the money where you're going to get information that's going to be valuable. Right. And investing in your pet's health and, right. and not necessarily being so regimented about, you know, like you said, if you do it every year, you're, you're damaging their system and not improving it. Exactly. And the other Beautiful. problem that I see is uh, the veterinarian will recommend, okay, your dog needs distemper, hepatitis, parainfluenza, parvovirus, uh, bordetella, um, Lyme, yeah. lepto, influenza, A, influenza B, rabies, and then they give them all at the same time. Oh, well, you know, that's, I just ticked off about 15 things and the immune system goes, I don't even know what to do with that. So, yeah. and if you, particularly the smaller the dog, the more reactive they're going to be to vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So if, and all size dogs get the same dose of vaccine. So if you have a five pound dog, it's getting okay. the same dose as the 150 pound dog. So you do yeah. not want to have all that bombarding your dog system at one time. Yeah. You need to spread them out. If you're going to give multiples, you need to spread them out. Okay. So you recommend, I did notice on your intake form, which we're going to talk about later, but you recommend one shot per visit. Is that right? Yep. Yep. And it's hard because a lot of the vaccines come as combos. So one syringe might contain five vaccines. Oh, and when you okay. say to your veterinarian, no, I don't want five given together. They go, well, I only have it this way. <laughs> Yeah. So then you either have to find somebody who has individual vaccines or you have to get them to order it, which good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it can be difficult. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, my mind is like blowing up already. Thank you for being the voice for the pets for the vaccines. This is huge. I can't wait to find out what you're going to tell us about the food. <sighs> okay. Well, food actually is my specialty. So I started okay. out as a traditional veterinarian. I, I grew up in a traditional household um, with you know respect to what we thought about doctors and medicine. And I went mm -hmm. to a school in the Midwest. So very traditional in the early 1980s. We're talking traditional. And yeah. I was in practice for about 10 years and accidentally took a chiropractic course. So that's the CVCP after my name. That's chiro, uh, veterinary oh, chiropractor. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I accidentally 
took that class. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was something else to do with surgery. And then I found out it was chiropractic. I started using it. My mind was blown because I was making such huge differences in my patients. Like I was taking dogs that couldn't walk and making them run again just by doing Love it. just by doing chiropractic and, and of course then i had to go through the crying grief of all those dogs that i hadn't saved for the 10 years before because i didn't have this tool in my toolbox it was very sad uh, but i got yeah. over that and said well you know forward um yeah so then, because it was so powerful i said well you know what there's got to be other stuff out there so mm -hmm. i started studying traditional chinese veterinary medicine and there's four branches we usually just think of acupuncture but yeah. the four branches are actually acupuncture, herbal therapies, um, food therapy, and okay. tuina, which is sort of a combination chiropractic massage. Yes. So when I got into all of that, the food therapy hit me like a ton of bricks. So I've actually written three cookbooks for dogs. The most popular one is the yin and yang nutrition, maximizing health with whole foods, not drugs. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, th that one's been great, been really helpful. It was actually really helpful for me in practice because when people would come to me and I'd say, okay, I have to make a diet for heart disease or kidney disease. And I have to sit there and write out a diet every time. Now it's just like, here's the book. <laughs> Use this page, yeah. this page, and this page. <laughs> so it made it much simpler. Um, but uh, what I discovered when I started really looking into food therapy and the power of food is mm -hmm. I discovered the power of food to kill as well as the power of food to heal. So yes. years ago, there was the movie Supersize Me about the guy yes. who decided for a month all he would do is eat McDonald's and he would supersize every meal and he blew up like a balloon, went into liver failure, he was really sick. So that processed yeah. fast food just about killed him. Like if he hadn't stopped, yeah. he probably would have died. Yeah, and his doctors were begging him to stop. Yes, and you know yes. what? I have friends and relatives who that's all they eat. They're dying. It's not pretty. So mm -hmm. um, basically, processed kibble pet mm -hmm. foods for yep. our pets are like eating at McDonald's all the time. It's like eating Doritos all the time. Yes. They are processed at, and I actually took a course on how, I went to Kansas State University where they teach how to make pet food, how to formulate pet food. And I learned how to make dry kibble pet food and went, oh my gosh, I cannot believe we feed this to our animals. Wow. So, problems with it. First of all, cats are obligate carnivores. They need a meat-based diet. Yes. Dogs have zero requirement for carbohydrates in their diets. If you, even when we go to the, the, the formulators, the, the regulatory bodies that tell us what we have to put in food to make it nutritious for pets, zero requirement for carbohydrates. But yes. dry kibble is at least 50% carbohydrates. Yeah. And the reason for that is if you get too much meat in a kibble, the process is an extrusion process that it goes through, it won't stick together in a kibble. It makes a mm -hmm. gummy, disgusting mess, glue, goo, and it doesn't come out of their machine in these nice little pellets. So right. they have to use binders and those binders are starches. Starches do mm -hmm. nothing good for our pets. They contribute to obesity, inflammation in the body, um, diabetes, arthritis, I mean, just so many problems. And now we're seeing that there are even heart related diseases. We've, we knew it in cats back in the 1980s when they decided to start feeding cats kibble that's corn based instead of meat based. Yes. Um, so we've known for a long time that if we don't have enough meat in the diet, we can see these heart problems. Well, now we're seeing them in dogs. Huh, shock. Yes. But part of the problem is they discovered that instead of using even the 30% meat protein that they might be able to use in kibble, they were like, aha, if I want 28% protein in there, I can make half of that come from peas. Peas are high in protein. Well, the peas don't contain the amino acids that the heart needs. So now mm -hmm. we've got dogs developing heart disease because they're not getting the amino acids they need because they're not getting meat in their diets. If you right. think about when dogs moved in with people, they moved in with us because they started uh, rummaging around our trash piles way, way, way back <laughs> when we started having societies and then we had to have trash sure. piles where we threw our bones and things. And so the dogs would come and they would scavenge and the, the cats as well. So then we started having farms and we grew our, my, my mother grew up on farms. So where did all the excess from the farm and the excess from their kitchen go to. It went to the dogs. So they were getting mm -hmm. meats, they were getting 
they were getting milk from the cows. So they were getting what they're supposed to be eating. And so now yeah. we've taken our animals and we've put them on these highly processed foods that don't have the meat content that they need. They've got highly inflammatory things in them. And because right. the nutrition is cooked out of them, then they add a synthetic vitamin mineral mix back in to get the vitamin and mineral levels to read what we need them to read in order to fulfill the requirements to sell it as a complete and balanced diet. The problem right. is all those synthetics, the body reacts to, the body says, oh my gosh, that's a foreign invader. I need to have an allergic reaction to that. So again, more allergies, more skin disease, more infections, more inflammation, more ear infections. So, we need to, sorry, this is my soapbox. Like you get me going on this, I'll go for till next week. You go, sister. I am super <laughs> excited about it. I love it. So uh, I'm a huge proponent of raw feeding, and I know it's not for everyone, but it is the fastest growing uh, group in pet feeding right now is the raw feeders, because that's yeah. what our pets are really meant to eat. Now, and I'm not saying yeah. our dogs are the same as wolves. They've evolved a little bit. Um, sure. But my dogs have been raw fed for 20 years and they do mm -hmm. great. I also make gently cooked meals for my dogs and mm -hmm. not, not all, do and my cats eat raw as well. Um, not all of them should be raw fed. There are some, their digestive tract just doesn't work well enough. They've got too many issues. <clears throat> Fine. Sure. We'll gently cook for them. We'll help digest, pre-digest it a little bit for them. I sure. don't use grains in my diets. I don't use starches in my diets because they don't need them. They don't contribute anything good. And for me personally, I would much rather get all my vitamins and minerals from whole foods. So right. even if I'm using a supplement to get those vitamins and minerals, that supplement is going to be a whole food supplement, not a synthetic supplement. So yes. I, I think that uh, we need to get back to feeding from from that perspective. And the other problem that we see in the pet food industry with the processed foods, we've had recalls for, and everybody wants to blame raw food for recalls with bacteria. We have had uh, kibble recalls, many more for kibble mm -hmm. than for raw food, for salmonella, yeah. E. coli, um, excess vitamin D that killed thousands, thousands of animals oh. a couple of years ago, pentobarbital, which is euthanasia solution, huge lawsuit going on with that right now. What? That yeah. was in a, a kibble? It was in a canned food from a pet food company that advertised that all of their meats were USDA approved. No, they were going and getting them from the roadkill guy and oh putting it in gosh. pet food, but their they website said that it was all, all good stuff. So you, yeah, sometimes it's really hard. Yeah, like you oh. can't even trust the websites. So my heart, my head, I yeah, can't do it. Uh, so yeah, it was actually okay. a friend of mine who's, uh, she had five dogs that she fed the same cans of food and within 20 minutes, the dogs were all falling over and one actually <gasps> died. She happened to be a lawyer. So she was smart enough to have an autopsy, have the stomach contents tested, have the canned food tested and found that there was euthanasia solution in it. And that's what killed her dog and made the other four sick. Um, and we've seen this and the head, uh, so the rendered products go into pet food. Basically pet food is the waste products from the human food industry, pet mm -hmm. feed, I should say. Um, yeah. so, cause there's a difference between food and feed. Um, and it is yeah. pet, pet feed is regulated as feed, like livestock feed. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the standard is <laughs> pretty low for that. Um, so uh, the president of DARPRO Rendering, which is the largest rendering group in the country, gave the keynote speech at one of the AFCO meetings, which is the feed control officials. Right. And in his speech, he said, well, frankly, it's pretty impossible not to have pentobarbital in a rendered product. Oh. But it's not in a high enough quantity that it's going to cause a problem. I don't know about you, but any at all is too much. I am not feeding my pet euthanasia solution on a daily basis. And the problem is we get so stuck in a rut of putting the same thing in the bowl day in and day out. So that, yeah. all that stuff is accumulating in the body. So with my dogs and my cats, they're raw fed or gently cooked or just given fresh food. It's not even always a balanced diet. It's like, oh, we're going to have, I had a huge abundance of eggs this morning. I'm like, hey, we're all having scrambled eggs. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I'm rotating all the time and I'm making sure that we're not getting deficiencies in our diet by saying, 
and we don't develop allergies to our food because we eat a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about how you would feed yourself or your children, I actually had a box of cereal converted into human grade kibble. I had a label made for it and it said 100% yeah. complete, complete and balanced, just dump it in your child's bowl twice a day, feed it to them, good to go. Yeah. If, if our pediatrician told us to do that, we would say, you are crazy. But yet your veterinarian tells you to do that and you go, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So it's really time, what you're saying is, it's time for us to take back control of knowing exactly what is going into our pet's digestive systems, giving them real food to help culminate, culminate real health and exactly. vitality. Exactly. And I'm not saying that you have to make your own food. And uh, I'll give you a tip. There's a great website. You'll have to pay a couple of bucks to get it, but there is the list susan thixton at truthaboutpetfood.com puts out the list every year pet food companies cannot buy their way onto the list they need to be human grade and they need to show bills of lading for every ingredient that they purchase that goes into their pet food proving where it comes from that it is healthy that it is good not very many make the list every year but you, Love know, that. You, you can pay as little as $10 to get the list uh, and you can get it at any time of the year, but she puts a new one out about every December or January. Um, and if you find a company on the list, I actually have a list on, on my website of, uh, you can download by subscribing to our newsletter. You'll get a list that says, okay. these are the foods I'm willing to feed my pets. And my list changes occasionally. Um, uh -huh. But Susan's is basically, she does a lot more research. It's what she does for a living now. Um, she's really our pet advocate in the pet food world. She's amazing. Um, so, uh, you know, it really is, if you don't want to make your own, which I get, I understand. But one of the things that you get told in the veterinary office is, oh my gosh, don't give them any table food. Don't give them any oh my people gosh. food. Well, why uh, right. is it people food? It's not people food, it's food. food. You should be able to yeah. eat. Food. Now, there are some things you can't give your dogs. Don't give them grapes. Don't give them raisins. You know, don't give them chocolate. Don't give them alcohol. Um, but for the, I can't believe you actually had to say alcohol. Do some people do that? Oh, God, yes. No. no. Yeah. So, but, you know, and if it's junk food for you, if you like Doritos, they're junk food for your dogs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It's okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not shaming. I'm just saying, if you like that, it's junk food for you, and it's junk food for them. And if you give them the occasional piece of popcorn or a Dorito, you're not going to kill them with it. By the way, uh, but that should not be what they live on. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's interesting because occasionally I run into to pet caretakers, animal caretakers that are are feeding their dog something toxic. And they'll say, but they love it so much. And I'm like, yeah, well, I hear they eat antifreeze too, but it doesn't mean it's good for them. Just exactly. because it's sweet and tasty doesn't mean they should eat it. That's your yeah. call. It's your responsibility as a pet owner, pet caretaker, um, to make sure that they are doing nutritious foods. Yes. yes, please. Oh my gosh, so much more. Okay, so we are, we're coming up to, um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, you want to talk about drugs and also chemicals yeah so i can kind of lump this all in because i know we're getting short on time yeah we want to respect everybody's uh, time and yours as well so uh one of the problems that i've seen uh, oh gosh since the first book from needles to natural came out i actually had to pull that book back from the um from the editor because these new drugs came out right when i sent it in and i said wait we gotta oh. add this in because there's a new class of pesticides that we are feeding our pets for flea and tick prevention. And we've had literally hundreds of thousands of deaths, animals that are now stricken with seizures for life, even after one yeah. dose. Yeah. All I can say is if you would not feed your child a pesticide, do not feed your dog or cat a pesticide. If you would not put the pesticide on your child's body, do not put it on your dog's body. Because by the way, if you have children, they're absorbing it by hugging your dogs, even after yes. it's dried on them. Um, mm -hmm. We have contaminated the waterways. Europe, the waterways are contaminated. Uh, California did a study where the waterways are contaminated from the chemicals that are being put on the dogs and washing off. And then also yes. being found in the urine of people because we're hugging our dogs and kissing our dogs. 
we don't need pesticides in our body. We don't need to be destroying our liver. We don't need to be destroying our kidneys or our pets, liver and kidneys or our children's. So, mm -hmm. um, and I have tons of blogs and information about this on my website. Um, I'm actually doing a talk coming up in a couple of months on the 10 most dangerous drugs in veterinary medicine. And unfortunately, because we have developed all these allergies from over vaccination, from synthetics in the food, from poor diet, mm -hmm. now we have all these anti-allergy medications like Apoquel and Cytopoint and Cyclosporin and steroids which shuts down the immune system. Well, yeah. how do we expect the immune system to have a good reaction and fight off disease if mm -hmm. we're constantly shutting it down? And so now right. we're seeing cancer. 1.6 out of every two dogs over age 10 will develop cancer. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. So we've got to stop pummeling them with drugs, antibiotics. Oh my gosh. The overuse of antibiotics in this world for people and pets is crazy. Right. If mm -hmm. I see, I get blood work all the time from clients saying, you know, here's the lab work on my dog. I took him in. He just wasn't doing right. He had a little bit of a fever. They put him on antibiotics and I look at the lab work and I go, well, there's no signs of infection. What are the antibiotics for? I don't know. Well, the vet right. doesn't know either. It's just, they wanted to give you something to get you out the door. Don't fall yeah. for it. Don't take it. Don't you you've got to push for a diagnosis get the lab work done get the cultures done get mm -hmm. a diagnosis before you start throwing medications at things because if you let's say your dog has all the symptoms of a urinary tract infection well if yes. you don't do the workup maybe it's not a urinary tract infection maybe they have a tumor in their bladder maybe they have kidney right. disease maybe they have right. an infection you know that, like leptospirosis maybe they have something else going on if you don't do the workup and you just accept an antibiotic and then, oh, it's not better in two weeks, you go back, you get another antibiotic. Oh, it's not better in two weeks, you go back and get another one. That's not the way to do it. We're just building resistance. We're killing off the gut flora, just making a disaster. <laughs> Agreed, yes, good work. Um, okay, so, oh, that covers drugs and chemicals. You're good. I, I told you I can love oh it. Oh my in. gosh, <laughs> gold star for you, gold star for you. Okay. Dr. Judy Morgan, first of all, what is your website? Where do people find you? <laughs> DrJudyMorgan.com. It's really simple. DrJudyMorgan.com. Okay. I also have a Facebook page, Judy Morgan DVM. Okay. And the, the link to your, um, your website is actually going to be below this video. Everybody, please click it and check it out. And I understand that you have a free gift for everyone that is watching today. Yes. So what I would recommend is that you download our free PDF, which is my veterinary checklist. It's called curbside veterinary checklist because we mm -hmm. made it during COVID when people weren't allowed to go in the building with their animals. And so mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that you had all your questions answered, everything in front of you, because a lot of times when you're going into the veterinarian, you're like, okay, I have to remember to ask this and this and this, and I want to show them this lump and this lump. And then you get in there and right. you go, uh, so oh. you fill this out before you go in, you take it with you and it will guarantee that you get everything covered. You won't leave anything out and your veterinarian, if you hand them a copy first, their eyeballs will get big and they'll tell you you're crazy. Uh, but it's highlighted with do not give any vaccines, do not treat my, it's amazing how many people tell me I took my dog in for his checkup and before I knew it, they had three injections in the dog and handed him a pill, which was one of the pesticides without even asking me. So That's you awful. want to go in forewarned, forearmed and let them know, no, we're not doing anything unless we talk about it and you have my permission. This is amazing. So this is something that you are offering to everyone, even people who are not seeing you, because this is something that you put together to make sure everybody was, is armed with the proper information and can relay it in a congruent way. Exactly. That is amazing. And I understand you also have some mini courses with a discount available to whomever might be interested as well. We do. So we have two courses, a dog longevity, it's about an hour and a half, and also a cat longevity. And it covers six points to keep your pets healthier and have a vital health and longevity because we want everyone to have their animals living two decades. Cats, I'd really mm -hmm. like to get into their third decade. So the yes. courses are called Dog Longevity and Cat Longevity, and you can get 50% off. They're not expensive to begin mm -hmm. with, but you can get 50% off if you use the code LONGEVITY, and they are on 
com slash store and i'm sure you'll post the link for that i will definitely post that link below this video everybody make sure that you check it out this is some really eye-opening and important information for all of us animal caretakers who are here to love and honor all pets and everyone like yourself dr morgan thank you so much for being here and illuminating this space for us today i appreciate you so much thank you thank you take care